This is Real Estate Rookie episode 321. Still kind of trying to learn all these terms, burr, fire, you know, financial free, all these things, um, terms. But I feel like with this condo that we bought in 2019, it was a two bedroom, two bath. We bought it and it had, it needed a full paint job, which we DIY'd. Then we rented it out. Fast forward four years later, we ended up um, actually selling that in 1031 it into our biggest short-term property that we had. But in between there, we also did a cash out refi on it because we increased the value with the burr, right? Pulled some cash out and we bought another property with that. I'm Ashley Kerr and I'm here with my co-host, Tony J. Robinson. And welcome to the Real Estate Rookie Podcast, where every week, twice a week, we bring you the inspiration, motivation, and stories you need to hear to kickstart your investing journey. Today, we've got a dynamic husband and wife duo, Joe and Andrea Del Grosso, and uh, I really enjoy chatting with them. We, we've had a few husband and wife duos on the podcast before, and just like the others, I think they've just brought a ton of value. Uh, there's one point where we're, we're like going over the numbers for their deal, and they invested twenty nine thousand dollars into one of their initial investments. And when I like, we did all the math like live on the podcast, and their minds were blown when they realized how much they had turned that twenty nine thousand dollars into. And I'll give you a small hint that it's over seven figures. So really cool episode. Uh, they talk a lot about light bulb moments they had on their journey, um, and they, they talked a little bit about how to get your spouse on board, which is a big question we always hear. So love talking to Joe and Andrea. What about you, Ash? They also share their mindset shift moment as to how they started their journey and then how they pivoted to something that they thought would suit what their their needs were and what they wanted out of their life. Um, so really interesting to hear how they went through that kind of shift. And then also talking about the short-term rental management stack of what are the pieces of software that they use to run their short-term rentals. And they talk about you know how they're able to do a lot of that stuff remotely and also, you know, how it's become more passive, like it's still very, very active strategy, but being able to use some of these software stacks and setting up different things within them has really helped them. So if you have short-term rentals, you want short-term rentals, and you're going to be managing them, this is definitely the podcast for you to listen to. And and ultimately, Joe and Andrea were able to achieve financial freedom and go full time into the real estate business with a relatively small number of properties. So if you're looking for that framework, this is the episode for you. Um, but I just want to share some some boring banter, Ash, some some uh, life updates. So um, we'll be she, she'll be 34 weeks this uh, this Thursday. Um, so we're we're getting pretty close to to crunch time. But um, actually, you know, so Sarah and I we've been dating since we were seniors in high school. So you know, we've been together for a long time. But we got married in our late 20s. And, um, you know, I come downstairs on Sunday morning, she like woke up before me and she's got the the living room filled with like balloons. And there's like a bunch of our engagement photos and, uh, the day I proposed to her and our wedding photos. And, um, it said happy 1000 days of being married together. And, um, you know, it was just such a, a special thing. And Sarah's always been so good at being creative. Never in a million years would I have thought to celebrate a thousand days of marriage, but, um, you know, she, she's, she's, uh, she's a special person like that. So I just, I just got to give a shout out to, to my wife who's eight months pregnant, still, you know, doing her best to make other people feel special. So thoughtful. That's really what she is and how she does that. And I had seen the, the pictures you posted on Instagram of it and stuff. So, uh, yeah, that was really, really sweet of her. Cool. Any, any boring banter on your side, Ash? Um, well, I went to the lake this weekend and I uh, did like a morning wake surf session and I face planted uh, pretty good. Once someone started videotaping me, I like smiled like, oh, I'm so cool. And then face plant, but um, I actually turned it into a reel on my Instagram. So if you want to go check out the video of me face planting and turned it into how you should be joining me in the real estate rookie boot camp and you'll face plan on your real estate deal if you don't. What? You want to check that out? You can go to biggerpockets.com slash bootcamps. <laughs> we're, we're, we're such uh, influencers now, right? Everything that happens in our life gets uh, gets turned into into social content. Before we get into the conversation with Joe and Andrea, I want to give a quick shout out to someone by the username of SherryJ68. Sherry left us a five-star review on Apple Podcast. She says, I love Ashley and Tony. Uh, I listen on my long drive to work on Thursdays and look forward to the real estate lessons from their guest. I'm a nurse practitioner and new to real estate, but I took the advice of some of the podcast guests 
and found myself a mentor, a JV partner, and met lots of new people at the local RIA meetups, and I'm ready to find my first flip. I have my team together, and I've been writing letters to target populations and feel like I'm almost there. My goal is to do some flips to fund my rentals and keep scaling. I'm so excited to start this new career, and I love it. Thank you so much for all the free education. I learn something new in every episode. Guys, that is why we do the Real Estate Rookie Podcast, is for stories just like that. So if you haven't yet, please do. It only takes a few minutes, a few moments of your your, your busy day, uh, but leave us an honest rating and review on whatever podcast platform it is you're listening to, because the more reviews we get, the more folks we can reach, and the more folks that hear this message, the more folks we can inspire to change their lives. So do us that favor, do someone else a favor, pay it forward. And congratulations to the person who wrote that review because they took action. It's easy to listen. Like the first step is listening to the podcast, <laughs> but really that second step of actually taking action. Um, so thank you so much for sharing that win with us that you've built your team out. That's really incredible. So for today's social media shout out, I want to give a shout out to Lauren Matina. So L-A-U-R-E-N dot M-A-T-T-I-N-A on Instagram. And Lauren is a science teacher and real estate investor, and she is sharing her journey on social media. So go uh, check out her Instagram page and uh, give her some support. Joe, Andrea, thank you so much for coming on the Real Estate Rookie Podcast. We are excited to have you both. Uh, if you guys can, just tell us a little bit about your backstory and how you got started in real estate investing. Yeah. So I'm originally from Boston. Um, I worked in television, so I moved all around. Uh, I went out to California for a little bit. And then in 2012, I moved to Knoxville, Tennessee, um, where Andrea and I met uh, at a company we were both working at in television. Um, and then, yeah, then we, I don't know, I guess we started our story together mm -hmm. and uh, started dating and, and we got married in 2015 and going through life. And, uh, and, uh, and eventually, yeah, we, we started our real estate journey in 2016 by our, buying a, a, a single family rental. And then today, uh, that has now jumped to, uh, we have six long-term rentals and four short-term rentals. Well, congratulations on that. Thank you. Yeah. It's kind of like the 30,000 foot view. <laughs> yeah. So what was that initial like moment where you were like, we're going to buy that single family house? What kind of walk us through those initial conversations or, you know, was there one thing that happened where you were like, I want to do this? Yeah. So I would say in 2016, we were a year in, uh, married and, you know, we started to, uh, you know, make some money from our jobs. We were working really hard. Um, I mean, we were both doing 60, 70 hour weeks, um, you know, just grinding and really what was happening in my industry with TV, you know, streaming started to have a really big impact. And that was just throwing a lot of different curveballs in the industry. We were working crazy hours and there was just such a grind factor there um, that we just started asking the question like, I don't know, we, we just really sat down and I didn't want to be the 55 year old, 60 year old TV producer, you know, if, if I could even make it that far. Uh, there is a lot of like you get pushed out at a certain age. Andrea was working um, at, at some different companies there and she was working crazy hours as an accountant. And there was just a burnout factor. We we're like this. I don't know. Like this is, is this life? Like, are we going to be doing this until we're 65? Like we just started asking that question, uh, you know, what else? And that's really when, you know, I thought back to how I grew up and, you know, I was, uh, you know, one of three sons, uh, my parents had, uh, they were teachers, you know, so they weren't making a lot of money, but one thing they had, they had like two or three rental properties and they were really able to give us this great life on a teacher's salary because they were able to access the equity in the properties and they sold some and then bought some. So, I mean, there was always that presence of real estate in the background that I saw growing up. So when the time came for us to be like, we need to add some security to our lives. Um, that was the, like the natural step forward. There was looking into real estate and I bought the, uh, the stock market for dummies book. And I literally did not understand it. So I was like, we got to do, <laughs> We got to do something else. No day trading. <laughs> no day trading. I literally have no idea how that works. So no, the, the real estate growing up around it, it just was that natural thing for us to ask, like, you know, you know, how could we get involved in it? I, I want to circle back to something that you just said, Joe, because I, I think it's it's. There, there's a lot to unpack there, and I don't even think you realize this, but you said that you you wanted to add some security to your life. 
and you know your your answer to that additional security was investing in real estate but there are so many people who look at real estate investing as risky and they're afraid to put money into this business because they might lose it all or they're afraid to go out and get debt because Dave Ramsey says you shouldn't do that or they're afraid to you know just do all the things that go into being an entrepreneur and building your own real estate business how were you able to frame going into entrepreneurship as the less risky path? I mean, really, it's like the, the real estate stuff. It's not harder than your W-2 job. I'll say that. Like everyone thinks it's this big, you know, foreign thing and it's like a different language and all that. Like it is not trigonometry. It is not algebra 10. Like it's really <laughs> like it's it's easy to understand. You just got to take that first step. And I mean, it just gives such a great you know, piece of security. It's not like this sexy crypto, you know, risky thing there. Like it is, there's a reason why what 90% of billionaires and millionaires in the country own real estate. You know, it is, it's an asset class that is so forgiving as, as an investment. Um, you know, you can trip up and, and make a mistake and there's always just time I feel like to make it right. Um, we're definitely not perfect. We've made some mistakes, but like what I love about this asset class is like, you can make a mistake and, and whatnot. You can't, you cannot be perfect and you can still do well in it. And it's just, and it pays you in multiple ways too. Like, you know, all those other investment avenues, I feel like didn't have, you know, the different uh, contributions that uh, real estate does. Andrea, what about you? Do you have any kind of background in real estate at all? Or was there anything that you found was kind of give you an advantage and kind of what you brought to the table in your partnership? Uh, I had absolutely no experience, no exposure. I was, I, I came from like, I don't want to say came from nothing. It was a harder, harder childhood. We'll just say that. Um, and, um, you know, lost my dad young, we had to go bankrupt. And my mom, like if growing up, I thought if I can make $40,000 a year, I've made it because that's just kind of, you know, what our exposure was. So when it came around to real estate, I just wrote his you know, coattail on it. He was the one educating. He was the one listening to the podcast. I was completely clueless. I was like, I can keep our books. You know, I can do the bookkeeping. So I had QuickBooks experience. So I felt good about that. I felt good about, you know, kind of the DIY side of properties and making sure that they're taken care of and they look good and people feel at home when they walk in. But real estate business as like that industry completely clueless and was flying blind with him, like yeah. letting him leave. There were some hard conversations at the beginning. And yeah, no, we, we worked through it. I think that you just said two things right there. As you, you made it a point to say, I had no real estate business background, but you brought two things to the table. You brought your accounting background doing bookkeeping. And then you said, you did the DIY stuff is like you had the eye for that. And, you know, that that is a, a big thing. Like I love design and I love rooms. I cannot put a room together to save my life. I love it, but I can't do it. Other people can do it way better, more efficient than me. But those are those things may seem like mediocre things, but having somebody take care of your books, Tony and I hate bookkeeping and like somebody coming on board to partner with us say like we'll do all the bookkeeping we have experience like you don't have to worry about it anything like that like that would have been like a huge you know attribute to our our business so I think the the point is not to limit yourself as to what you're bringing to the table because all of these skill sets like help and they actually can really um create this great business. And that is part of the business, even though you might think, well, I'm not a real estate agent or I'm not, you know, doing remodels or something like that, or I haven't had an investment property, all these other skill sets add, add to the pile. No, I was just, just going to touch on like those beginning conversations. Like, you know, she, they were hard in, in the sense of like, Hey, I think we should do real estate investing. You know, I think this will give us a, the security we're looking for, you know, and at the time I think there's that give and pull of like, you know, we were saving like crazy. We were really big savers and whatnot. And she's like, Hey, you know what? We should use this money to renovate our bathroom or do the floors. And there's just like where I give Andrea credit is like, she, you know, put those wants on hold. And it was like, all right, if you think this is the right journey, like let's, let's take the first step. It's so funny. Me and Ash talk about this all the time, but like my Airbnbs, uh, the flips that we do, they're all much nicer than like my primary residence. Like 
we had paper shades, like the little, you know, we had fake blinds, the paper shades at our primary residence for like two years <laughs> because, you know, all the extra money that we have, we we're putting back into the business. So I think it's a, it's a willing sacrifice, um, or maybe not a willing sacrifice, but it's a sacrifice you have to make if you want to invest into your business. Um, so just kind of going back to the beginning here, right? So first you, you guys to scale, you know, relatively well, you've got 10 properties over the course of seven years. You know, it's more than one property every year uh, since that time frame. But I, I want to go back to that first deal. You know, so when you guys made that decision to become real estate investors back in 2016, I'm assuming you guys, you know, based on your DIY background and, you know, Joe, with your your dad's experience, you guys probably knew a lot about investing at that point. Is that a, a fair assumption or were you guys kind of flying by the seat of your pants? You're both shaking your heads no. Um, so, uh, <laughs> Joe, maybe let, let's start with you, right? Like, why didn't your experience with your dad or, or kind of his uh, lessons make it easier for you that, that first go around? I mean, I feel like being around it, my dad's properties and my mom and dad's properties made it easier for me to get into it, but I had no idea what we were doing. Like, I didn't know how to renovate anything. I didn't know how to really assess like the rent and like we, we didn't even have separate bank accounts. We didn't know it could be a business. Yeah. We didn't, had we no just idea. were parking that first one to park some money and build some equity and have a tenant pay down our mortgage. We didn't realize we could make this a livelihood and we can build it into the business that it yeah. is today. Yeah. No. That that took about three, three years before we had that moment. Yeah. And I think whenever you get really first into real estate, you try to find like your lane. It's like, all right, I thought I was going to love the renovation stuff. Like I touched a floor and I was like, nope, I'm done. Nope. I don't want to do this. <laughs> and, uh, and you know, it's like you try to find your lane. And then meanwhile, I feel like we didn't even really know your DIY skills until that first property and your love of it, all of a sudden you're tearing down walls and kitchens and bathrooms and closets. And it's like, I didn't know you could do that. So yeah, you fall in love with the different lanes, you know? So let's start with that, that first property you, it was a single family home. Kind of tell us about it. What was your investing strategy for that? Was it short term, long term, and kind of give us a little backstory to that. And then maybe what you went on to next after that. Yeah, so it was a single family condo. Uh, it was one hundred fifty thousand. Um, so we just did a twenty percent down investment loan. Uh, pretty straightforward. I mean, the the money for the down payment just came from us saving like crazy, um, and we just used it as a long term rental. Funny enough, so that was in two thousand sixteen. The tenants, our first tenants, are still there, which is just wild. Like, I mean, that's seven years later, they're still going. So now it's just a long term rental, just plain and simple. We probably should have charged more rent at the time than what the mortgage was. We didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So with that property, are, do you continue on and do long-term rentals? Yeah. So uh, 2016, we bought the first one. And then um, 2017, we didn't buy any. I mean, we were going through different things like financially where uh, in the TV industry where we didn't feel comfortable buying in 2017, but um, or we weren't able to really. And then 2018 and 2019 is where we bought two more uh, single family long-term rentals. Again, it was just all savings and just grinding and saving every penny we can. Like we, like anytime we got a raise or a bonus, like we acted like we didn't, you know, it's like we, we would take any additional money and just put it into account to invest. And, and that I feel like was just a lot of delayed gratification for a young couple in their early thirties. We wanted to buy a boat. We didn't. <laughs> um. So yeah, and then yeah, 2019 is when we took a big direction or yeah. uh, like a mindset shift. But yeah, um, those first three years we bought three properties. Mindset shift. Tell us about that. Yeah, because I'm I'm curious. Like, at what point did you guys make the transition from like, hey, we're just dumping money and or parking money into this to kind of get appreciation to like it actually being a business? Um, so I'm gonna answer that one. Um, he was to, he had a job and was kind of running the roads a lot. He was just driving a lot, and he started you know, that the writing was on the wall. We became parents. We had twins in 2019 and it was like, all right, kind of that aha moment. Like we don't want to be in the W twos full time. We realized we already had, what did we have at that point? Four, three or four long terms, three. So he's, then he had discovered bigger pockets and podcast. He, this boy who did not like school education, read 20 real estate books in one year. Okay. <laughs> he would get up at Yes. Yeah. Working his full-time job, new dad of twins, like, and he really just took that shift and he'd come home and like our pillow talk at night became what book he had read, you know, through that week or whatever. And he was really passionate and really on fire with it. And so from that, then he started 
pushing me. He'd send me these podcasts. I'm like, what is a podcast? (laughs) And um, he introduced me to Investor Girl Brit, which I fangirled out about all her stuff. I wanted to be her. And so that I feel like was the big shift was when he consumed all the education, consumed all the information that he could, and then shifted it to me to be like, hey, you have an interest in this. Listen to this girl. And that's when we bought one of the biggest kind of shifting condos that we'd like to talk about because it was such a um, game changer for us in so many different real estate points that it hit. Andrea, I just want to, you know, I, I got to pause on something that you said, because one of the questions that Ashley and I get all the time is how do I get my spouse on board with real estate investing? And what you just described of Joe, Andrea, is like the formula that spouses should try and follow. You didn't say that he came to you one day and said, hey, I want to take our life savings and invest it into this harebrained scheme I heard on this podcast. You said you saw you saw this guy who didn't like traditional education read 20 books in one year, listen to every single podcast he could get his, you know, hands on and would, you know, share with you all this information. Like that is how you get your spouse on board. You show them how committed you are with your action and that's what gets them to kind of buy into this idea. So Joe goes on this journey, he kind of, you know, gets you drinking the Kool-Aid a little bit and then you you say you you stumble upon this condo. So what's the what's the story behind the condo, Andrea? So we brought we bought it in 2019, and again we're still kind of trying to learn all these terms: burr, fire, you know, financial free, all these things, um, terms, HELOCs and cost segregate, all these real estate terminologies, right? That you just we were clueless on. But I feel like with this condo that we bought in 2019, it was a two bedroom, two bath, great part of um, West Knoxville. We bought it, and it had. It needed a full paint job, which we DIY'd. And that's when he was just, he would literally push play on a podcast and then he'd leave while I was like painting and he'd come in, bring lunch was, and all the things. It was pretty it, cute. It sounds so evil now, but like, I remember her being in the upstairs bedroom and she was painting and working on the bathroom. And I literally like would hit play and like walk <laughs> out. And I'm like, it was yes. awesome though. It, it, it fired me up to hear other stories. Like we listened to y'all's podcast. Like I heard other couples that were successful in this and it really got my brain going while I was you know, my hands were busy. I was painting. Um, from there, we also redid the kitchen. So we we essentially did a burr on this condo. We um, we painted the kitchen cabinets ourselves at home after our babies were asleep and after we worked our full time job for the day. Uh, we had some. We had a contractor hire out. We redid the backsplash. We knocked down some cabinets. We just did some work, right? We hired some and we DIY'd some. Then we rented it out. And um, let's see. Fast forward to was it this year we sold it? Yep, sold it. Yeah. Fast forward four years later, we ended up um, actually selling that and 1031 it into our biggest short-term property that we had. But in between there, we also did a cash out refi on it because we increased the value with the burr, right? Pulled some cash out and we bought another property with that. So that property taught us so much that we learned about in books, we heard about on podcasts, but until you get in and do it, that's when we really had like our real estate, you know, university, right? Ash, can we, can we just like break down like all the different ways they just made money off of this one deal? So, uh, you like, this is the amazing power of real estate investing, right? So you got, you guys buy the condo, put in some sweat equity. You rent it out for several years, so you're getting loan pay down, appreciation, and cash flow from the, the during the time that you're renting it out. You said you did a cash out refinance at least at one point after you finished the, the initial rehab, took that cash, dumped it into another property, held it for several more years, got more cash flow, and then 1031 that into another larger property. So you got you got paid like four or five different ways off of one condo that cost you, you said that the purchase price was $150,000. No, it was a hundred, 129,000. So like we, like our, like, <laughs> down pay, like our all in on the deal was like 20,000 or something. Not even. Yeah. yeah. It's just the power of real estate that once you can see it's, yeah, it's mind blowing. So $29,000 um, is your down payment. What was the value of what's the value today of those two properties that you purchased? The first one from the refinance and the second one from the 1031 exchange. Oh gosh, I mean, what, I mean, so so that was Antler and that was Powder Mill, so 1.5. Yeah. No freaking way. 
Yeah. Yeah. yeah I mean, well, yeah, they're both cabins. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, the cash out refi was to buy our short term rental in Blue Ridge. And then the 1031 sale was to buy another cabin in Sevierville. Mm-hmm. So twenty nine thousand dollars. Yeah, yeah. I've never yeah. really put yeah, it that I have, way. <laughs> I was trying to like quickly calculate uh, those numbers before, and I'm like, is this? Am I looking at this right? We okay. Well, one one way we were looking at it was like some of our long term rentals are like we're going to have those for 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 uh, forever because they're they're great quality and they attract great tenants. But this one we knew was kind of like our beat up property. We're like we're gonna, you know, we're gonna flip this thing or renovate this thing and really just make the most out of it so we can level up. And that was this one. We top leveled. <laughs> yeah, top leveling, as they say. So we, we threw around the phrase 1031. Uh, so Joe, Andrea, whichever of you, if you wouldn't mind, just defining define what a 1031 is and why you guys use that strategy. Um, so a 1031 is when you take the proceeds from, essentially, if you sell a, an investment property, right? Uncle Sam's going to want a piece of your, your gain. So you have to pay capital gain taxes. A way to avoid that is this 1031 exchange. You basically hire a third party, You have it, it's specific 1031 handlers. I don't know what their official title is, but, um, intermediary, intermediary. There you go. So you, you get the proceeds from, you know, property A, if you sell it and they hold this, they hold all of it. We never saw a penny of the gain from the sale of Bellbrook. They held it. You have a certain amount of days to identify one of three properties that you're going to buy. You have a certain amount of days then to close on one of three properties. And then once you do that 1031 intermediary, intermediary, um, then sends a check to the closing company for your new property. So essentially it just sideswipes your, your taxes and it just goes from one to the other. Now those gains are now sitting on this new property that we have. So if we were to just ever sell it, then we have to pay, you know, the gains on that, but we can, you know, deal with that then or 1031 it into another property, but <laughs> it's essentially a tax saving they they call it swap till you drop. So basically, you just keep ten thirty one ing into you know the next property until the day that you die. And I don't really know what happens after you die. Uh, like if I don't know if those taxes get like passed on to your estate or how that works. But basically, for the entire time that you're alive, it doesn't. Oh, see, yeah. I listen to a podcast on that. Defer actually. defer till you de- you die. Defer <laughs> defer defer death is what it was called yeah. or something. What was your biggest uh, lesson learned from doing that, and why do you think somebody should look into? doing a 1031 exchange. I think we had a little bit of imposter syndrome. Like we were such, you know, um, linear, like very safe, play it safe investors, you know, buy, rent it out. Don't, don't get crazy. Like we don't like risk and whatnot. I think really the lesson we like to share is like, I mean, there's just so many creative ways that you can expand your portfolio by accessing the equity in there. And really that was just huge for us. And like, just thinking outside that box, like, no, we don't have to just play it safe, rent it out and call it a day. It's like, we can access the equity in there to really just blow up our portfolio. Cause up until that point, it was save, 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 buy, empty out the account, save, 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 buy, empty out Mm -hmm. the account. And, but since 2019, we have not used a penny of our personal savings to buy a property. It was, it's all accessing the equity that we've created. So I, I, I want to ask something because, in, and it kind of ties back to what we talked about earlier, but, um, you know, you, you said that you, you kind of went into this with no real understanding of what a real estate business was. You were just kind of flying by the seat of your pants. You have this aha moment in 2019 where you go on this learning binge to learn all things, uh, real estate business. But then what was the, was that the, the kind of aha moment or, or the light bulb that went off to transition from long term to short term? Or what, what was the motivation to kind of ditch the, the long term mental space? And cause it, it sounds like your last several purchases were all short term, correct? Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 Well, I guess just walk into the motivation for the change. I mean, so I think our plan up till 2019 was like, hey, we're going to buy, we were in our mid thirties, we're going to buy 10 long-term rentals, pay them off and retire in our mid to late forties. Like, I think that was our plan, like nice and safe and, and whatnot. But then as we, you know, got older and like our kids were growing up and, you know, we had another baby on the way, even before that, I guess Mm -hmm. we were like, how can we speed this up? Like, we don't want to wait, you know, another 10, 15 years to get financial freedom. We want to like go faster and that's when, you know, we discovered short term rentals and the cash flow that that offers. It's three, four times more than what the long term rentals are. So we're like, this can, instead of waiting 10, 15 years, you know, let's let we can speed this up in two, three years, you Thank know, you, and that, Avery Carl. Yeah. They, I mean, the Avery <laughs> Carl podcast. I know that was big for a lot of people when she did that original bigger pockets one, but yeah, that played a huge part in it. So with your short-term rentals, tell us what is one thing that 
you would give or tell, I guess, as advice to a rookie investor as to like what they should be looking for. So what was part of, you know, when you decided to make that transition, what were maybe some of your criteria or your buy box of like, this is what we want to do in short terms. Yeah. Short terms. I, I think for us, like we want, like we're both like very, you know, particular about what we want and how we manage our stuff. So I think for us, it had to be within drivable distance to us because we wanted to be hands-on and involved. So then we just literally took a map, draw, drew a big circle. And it's like, all right, we want to be in the Southeast drivable distance from Knoxville. What drove me crazy was like, we were doing all this stuff and investing in Knoxville right down the street from Sevierville. And we had no idea that that was like becoming the Mecca of short-term rentals. We were like, oh man, we missed the boat. And um, no, I mean, I think it's, we're attracted to vacation markets. I know some people, you know, like to go into the metro markets, but, um, we like the vacation markets. So we're in Sevierville, Blue Ridge, Georgia, and then Panama city beach, Florida. So that was a big thing being able to drive there ourselves. And, and also I mean, being a, a property that we would want to stay there with our family, you know, we wanted it to be relatable in that way. Yeah. And I, I just want to go back because you, you mentioned about, you know, how can we, shorten the time to achieve financial independence and uh, doing it with like the least number of properties possible. And we had a uh, coach Chad Carson on episode 306 of the rookie podcast. He just recently released his book, the small but mighty investor. Um, and it just kind of ties into the whole mindset that, that you guys just displayed or, or talked about of how can we do this without having thousands of, of units or doors we have to manage ourselves. Yeah. That's our whole thing. I mean, we're, we pride ourselves on being small and mighty investors. Like we don't want 500, 2000 units. Like we love the people that do that because they're really inspirational. I love those podcasts and I love listening to those folks talk, but like that's not in line with what our why is. Like we don't, we don't want to create another job for ourselves like that, you know? So, I mean, I, I, I love the small and mighty approach and I, I think that's what we keep to today. So one of the things that, uh, that Chad talks about is, and, and you know, we, we also have recently had Mike McCallowitz on the podcast as well. Um, I'll, I'll try and see if I can look up his, uh, his podcast episode, but, um, I, I think a lot of being able to scale your portfolio without it dominating your life is being able to kind of set up the right systems and processes to be able to, you know, hopefully offload some of that management, uh, tasks to someone else. So, as you guys have scaled up, I mean, because six, six short term rentals and, you know, for long term is, is not something to sneeze at. Like there, there's some management, uh, that, that goes into that. So how are you guys currently optimizing your own portfolio so that you can do it with the least amount of time possible? Uh, sure. So for our short term, short terms, we run hospitable, which Joe is the, Joe is the brains behind that. He's automated all the messages he's learned and studied and, um, done all those things. We have, recently, very recently, within the last two months, outsourced a bookkeeper because it just got out of hand. So that way I can be able to, I've shifted my focus to, um, you know, a direct booking site and trying to do our social media to drive traffic there. But um, we also just all the tools that we can use to make anything easier. I've discovered chat GPT, which helps us quickly write descriptions for social media or our Airbnb post makes us sound really good. Um, uh, what are our other tools? Google drive is another huge one that we, it's simple, it's easy, it's free, but it keeps us organized. We, I mean, we have a simple spreadsheet out there that me and him access and it's literally any uh, password or just background with all of the properties and, um, what other tools do we use? I mean, for the long-term rentals, I mean, they they kind of run themselves. It's crazy yeah. to say, but like I, we bought them right and we bought them like their B-class properties, the tenants that are there, we probably hear from them once or twice a year. I mean, like like the six long-term rentals run themselves and it's great. But yeah, for the short-term rentals, it, it's exciting. It's fun. Like we do a whole tech stack. It's hospitable for property management software that's messaging with the guests, which is just fantastic because, you know, that's a lot. Uh, we have a dynamic pricing tool, Price Labs, that sets all the pricing so we don't have to go in there. We got Turo, which can, uh, Turno. Turno that uh, connects with our cleaners. Like there's so many cool automation tools where this four, these four B&Bs that are just running full steam, we probably have like a mandatory five hours a week that we have to be involved. The rest of the time, it's just running itself on these automations, which is great. I really hope that everyone listening just wrote down that stack, that tech stack as even just a starting point as to like, okay, here's some resources I should look into. And even if it's not that specific brand, but something that does something similar, 
Uh, Tony, do you want to share your kind of tech stack real quick for uh, short-term rentals? Yeah, sure. Ours is ours is pretty similar, honestly. So we use um, uh, Hospitable as our PMS. We use Price Labs as our dynamic pricing tool. We use uh, Hostfully for our digital guidebook. And we use Breezeway for our property operations software. Uh, Breezeway is similar to, to Turno, uh, but we like Breezeway a little bit more. There's a little bit more functionality to it. Um, and then we use Slack to like message with our virtual assistants and kind of keep the, the whole team in line. So that's those five things are like our the baseline for our software stack. And when Tony says PMS, he means property management software, just to be clear. <laughs> yes. Be careful when you're saying, when you're yelling about PMS in public. Yes. <laughs> yeah. No, it's, it's, it's pretty funny. Like, uh, I mean, hospitable, it's, it's funny to see like guests interacting with the automated messaging. I'm like, this is great. Like, I remember that first week. I'm like, this is, I mean, this is amazing. I, I could have never been a B&B host or short-term rental host four or five years ago when this stuff wasn't around. Like I, I would have been terrible. I would have been like, what do you want? You know, <laughs> Turno, Turno has been the change, game changer for me because I'm the one that manages kind of the boots on the ground team members and Turno, it, we're not having to send them, Hey, here's our check-in and checkouts. Turno does all of that. Yeah. It, it communicates and pings the cleaner and they can send us pictures and text us about, you know, supplies that were out. So I, I'm very thankful for Turno. <laughs> so Joe, Andrea, uh, are you guys ready for today's rookie request line? Yeah, let's do it. All right. So, and for our rookies that are listening, if you guys want to get your questions featured on today's podcast, uh, head over to biggerpockets.com slash reply, and we just might use your question for today's episode. All right. So today's question comes from Ali Snyder Detilio, and Ali's question is, for those in business with your spouse, do you typically put both of you on mortgages for your investment properties or just one at a time to be able to max out the number of loans. Trying to get a gauge for how much we could qualify for individually, um, but how is the DTI calculated if we split the mortgage on our primary residence? Are we each responsible for 50% of that debt? So uh, Joe and Dre, I guess, what, what has kind of been your strategy for managing the loans and mortgages for your investment portfolio? I mean, so... Uh, for us, I mean, our, it's been both of our names on all the properties. Now, I know a lot of people are like, hey, split that up so you can get more of the traditional loans because, you know, you're only granted 10. Um, but we use both of our names for multiple reasons, just from a closing standpoint and like being able to get the properties we wanted as we were like always leveling up and buying more expensive properties. Like we needed both of our incomes, you know, on the uh, the statement. So, I mean, that really, I mean, our, we use both of our names really. Mm -hmm. Yeah, on all of yeah. them. Just, you know, from, from my own perspective, I think it, the, the goal probably should be to put the least amount of people on the mortgage as possible, right? If you're in a position to qualify with one person, it allows you to kind of free up more debt for the next person. Because yeah, even, even if one of you, if both of your names are on the mortgage, technically you're both, you know, tied to that entire debt. Uh, so it is easier sometimes to continue to scale if you can split it up that way. Ash, what are your, what are your thoughts? Yeah, that's what I was just going to say is even a lot of times they still look at it as if, okay, if you have a $1,500 payment and you're both on the mortgage, they're not going to split it in half and say, oh, we're only going to calculate your debt to income. For me, at least they've always done it the full amount because you are responsible because, you know, if somebody else, that other person isn't paying it, you still have to pay that full amount, the 1500 It's not like you pay your half, then they pay their half. So you had to kind of answer uh, Ellie's question would say that um, it will fully affect your debt to income. And I think that's an advantage if you can is to go into, you know, one person on one loan, the other person on another loan, something like that too, if you're able to do that. Yeah. If you can do it, definitely do to split it up. Yeah. When I first started, I pretty much had uh, my husband on as a co-signer with me because I barely made any money and he made the money. And that was like, so like well, first couple of rental properties that I did on my own is we both went on to them and did the properties uh, together as a, I guess, technically a co-signer or whatever, but he was actually on the deed of the property. And that was how I was able to get my first couple investment loans without using a partner. I think looking back, if we could go back in time, I would have had him on their first five, you know, solo. But yeah, and, just, and as I grew in my career was making more than I, we could have transferred. But in the, yeah, yeah, if we could, if we could advise anybody, yes. To your point, split it up. Yeah, if you can, if you have the income and the low debt thing, and you can get approved by yourself. And that's like such a great tip right there is try by yourself first. And then if they say, no, that's not going to work, then bring in your partner, your significant other, whatever, and then bring them on and say, well, now what if we both go 
um, onto the property. And like one thing too, with residential is you'll have to make sure that both people are on the deed. So you can't like have a co-signer, you know, if you were getting an apartment or if you were getting, um, you know, a car loan or something, you can have a co-signer who, you know, will be liable for it, but they're not actually titled to the property or to the assets such as uh, the car or something like that, or that, you know, they don't have rights to the actual rental property they're the person's leasing. So that's a big thing too, is that if you are going to partner with someone and you're both going to go on it, then you both go on to the deed too. All right. Well, let's jump down to the rookie exam. So Joe, Andrea, these are the three most important questions you'll ever be asked in your life. So Andrea, we're actually going to start with you. Um, so question number one, what's one actionable thing rookies should do after listening to your episode? I mean, really, it's like, I think our biggest thing has always just been perspective and writing down like what we want, like you, you can't start a race without understanding where the finish line is. And I think that is super important. Like we, once we really sat down and got intentional with it, like, Hey, we don't want to do the traditional path of 65, all that stuff. And we wrote it down. So like having that perspective, but then really keeping it as an active perspective, like don't just sit down once with your wife at the end of the night and write all this down. Like we, if you can see my office right now, it's whiteboards everywhere. And it is like, all of our goals are wise, like everything. And I see it every day. And it's that active, you know, perspective that just helps me remember when I'm in the fishbowl of day to day, like this is why we're doing this. What is one tool, software, app, or system in your business that you use? So Joe, you kind of did give us a breakdown, but maybe besides the short-term rentals, is there something else that you use maybe for the long-term rentals? I mean, our hub is is Google Drive, really. Like we could not live without that because that's where everything is shared. Like <laughs> Like whenever, like we traveled one time, I think early on and like, I literally, and I was like, if something happens to us, no one will know where all our information is. And like our, our loan information, our contractors, like everything. And like, we put everything now on a Google drive. And I think we like sent it to my mom before mm -hmm. we traveled. I was, like, <laughs> I was like, if anything happens to us here, take this. Um, but no, Google drive is like our biggest tool for our, our, uh, long-term rentals. It's, a, it's a small portfolio. It's manageable in that way. And, uh, yeah, we love that. What are some of the things that you're using to, to manage though? Is it like a uh, Google sheets or something like that to keep track and how are tenants paying Is it a check and are you using QuickBooks? You want to give us kind of like the glimpse into how you're self-managing that long-term rental? Yeah. Um, uh, they, we, we use Venmo. So they pay us every month on Venmo and it's just, you know, six tenants at this point. So it's pretty easy to, you know, realize if someone hasn't paid, but everything for us is, is pretty manual on the long-term side because it is, we just kind of set it and, and forget it kind of thing. Um, yeah, they pay us on Venmo and. Yeah. I think as now we're kind of scaling down like the, the buying, like we're really, we're pausing, you know, uh, like the acquisition side and really focusing on optimizing. And I think one thing we want to do is we can incorporate some of the software for the long-term rentals, like a rent ready, and whatnot that like does a lot of that and keeps it a little bit more organized DocuSign. and a little bit cleaner. Huh? DocuSign. Yep. Which I mean, rent ready, I think has oh, okay. features like that. So I think that's something where, as we now, like we we've hit financial freedom, we've crossed that finish line. We're like, all right, now let's focus on like optimizing some of these things that now that we finished the, a little bit of that race. <laughs> all right. Last question. Where do you plan on being five years from now? Five years from now. I mean, right now it's, uh, I would love to, uh, you know, we recently just paid off uh, one of our first properties, which was huge for us. And it was just such a great feeling. I mean, in five years, I want to have a few of the properties paid off. Um, we've now recently got into co-hosting, which has been great for us. Uh, a lot of people have followed our journey on Instagram and have reached out and DM'd us about um, hosting their properties. So that's something like we're really excited to just dive into and take on. So, I mean, in five years, I'd love to have you know, a boutique co-hosting business, a few more properties paid off and just enjoying our, our small and mighty portfolio. Um, and the time freedom with their kids. Yeah. I mean, time freedom has been great just even recently. Like we just took the summer off and I've just been hanging out with the kids, you know, and, um, just more and more of that. That's awesome. How old are your kids now? The twins are four and the baby boy is 15 months. Oh, so yeah, in five years, you have a lot more time freedom. There'll be a perfect age to go out and do things and travel and everything like that. That's awesome. That's exciting. Yeah. Yeah. I want to expose, I want to have that freedom to be able to expose them to things that, you know, we weren't at their age. So 
Yeah, we joke with my kids that they're getting spoiled because we'll go on a trip somewhere. And usually it's to a conference. It's not like even vacation, but we're traveling somewhere going to a conference and they'll uh, complain when I say that we're flying Southwest and not Delta because Delta has the TV screens. I'm like, you're getting to fly somewhere like this. When I was your age, that would have been so exciting. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man, we were doing the road trips back in the day. Yeah, 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 really. <laughs> Okay, well, where can everyone reach out to you guys and find out some more information? Where can everyone find us? Uh, so we are pretty active on Instagram. We're uh, at Southern Suns Properties. Um, I mean, that's really where we just have a lot of fun there. Um, you know, everyone can reach out to us. We're, we're pretty quick on responses and whatnot. And we just kind of the, over the last few years, we've just let everyone into our journey. And it's just been fun to see like who's interested in this world as well. And we've made some great connections through it. So yeah, we don't we don't paint the pretty picture that this is perfect. We we <laughs> have shared our fails, our you know hard days, our hardships, you know, and we we just kind of laugh at ourselves and keep it fun and lighthearted. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you guys so much. I I know Tony's still trying to figure out the math of turning that twenty nine thousand into one point five million. <laughs> <laughs> a little baffled as why that hasn't happened with this property yet. But um, thank you guys so much for joining us uh, on the Real Estate Rookie Podcast. I'm Ashley at Wealth from Rentals, and he's Tony at Tony J. Robinson. And we'll be back on Saturday with a rookie reply. Still, yeah.